speaker, Professor Jean-Marie Tarascon. Professor Tarascon is a professor uh, chemistry at the uh, College de France in Paris. And as many of our speakers, uh, in, if the audience is batteries, electrochemist, we don't really need to introduce Professor Tarascon due to his great contribution. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and the unique understanding of the systems. He is now the director of the French Research Network on Electrochemical Energy Storage, uh, our uh, s 2 e And he is also a board member of our INREP, and we thank him for that. And we also thank him for taking his time joining us today. OK, so uh, I don't know if you heard me. Yes, we can hear you. You won't see me because I don't know why the camera doesn't work. But you know, you don't want to see me anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so uh, thanks for uh, Doron for inviting me to this uh, conference. And uh, so I will start it. Uh, but the talk that I am going to give you today is going to be a little different of what uh, is going on or what I have been using to do. Uh, two seconds. Hey, guys. Two seconds because I have a small issue with my computer. Uh, how can I get this? It's gonna stop. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, what I will talk about today is about uh, adding some sensing and self healing functionality to batteries. And uh, why we are doing this, and let me give you some motivation. Ah, you start on the work. Oh, uh, why we do this? Because uh, if you look nowadays, what are the situation and the price of the batteries? You can see the LED is that uh, is going down, and Tesla has announced this one hundred dollar per kilowatt hour. Uh, General Motors has been doing the same, and bottom line, I think such a performance cost evolution ratio is going to impact very strongly tomorrow research. So is one white. In this case, I think for me, the direction and the future are twofold. Either you can work a new chemistry, whatever they are, means three state, redox flow, and so on. But at the bottom line, you will have to face the uh, great performance of lithium ion batteries. So, another option that uh, we are looking is really how we can increase the lifetime of battery increase reliability of lithium ion. So this is the reason why we are going to try to put smartness into the battery. To do so, why we need to do this? If you look at batteries, and I, hear, I just recall some very issues that we have with batteries that are really related to some metal dissolution, some dendrite, some redox shuttle, as well as there is some SCI, as very well known, and also some cracking into the electrode. And the question is, how can we solve the issues while the battery is running? So here we need to do some curing, and this curing are going to be done via some approaches that first require to identify the issue, like in medicine, you need to identify the tumor, and then after, you need to auto-repair by designing functionalized membrane or uh, self-feeding polymer relying on supramolecular versus covalent bonding. So this is more or less what my talk is going to be about today. I am going to give you a flavor of my new hobby. What am I doing these days is uh, uh, monitoring batteries via optical sensing, dealing with uh, FDG, which are fiber graph grating, and on which we can decouple chemical and, thermic and thermal events. Then I will really touch on the design of self healing membrane, looking at some interaction of cyclodestrin with membrane to capture and release species, not namely polysulfide. And then I will show you more or less how we can do or sequencing or discriminating polysulfate into membrane. And then I will rapidly conclude. So the first point is let's move to uh, monitoring, battery monitoring. And again, I don't think this is new at all because it is a half hole as a lead acid batteries, and which back to 1887, people were using hydrometer in order to know the state of charge of the battery. Over the years, a large amount of techniques 
has been developed as clearly indicated here. But today, I will have to focus more on what I will call this optical sensing, which can be either based on fiber grating, either on plasmonic or an evanescent wave spectroscopy, and so on. So why we are working on these optical fibers? Because till now, 99% of the experiment has been done by putting the sensor outside the battery, which, as you are going to see, is not perfect. So we move the LED into these optical fibers for the simple reason that the fiber, the picture that is indicated here, can move for 150 microns. And nowadays, we can have fiber with diameter of 520 micron nanometer, which is perfectly suitable to fit into the electrode and into the battery. So today, I will only focus on these optical fibers, which are based on this fiber bright grating sensor. So let me tell you more or less what are these sensors, because it is very important for you to understand this in order to follow the rest of this presentation. The sensors are clearly indicated here, are nothing else than a periodic repartition of the refractive index over a short distance. So that, in this case, what you have, uh, this sensor acts as a reflector of the, the wavelength of a specific wavelength, which is, in this case, defined by lambda, which is like, in this fraction, is equal to 2n, which is a refractive index, and uh, capital lambda, which is finally the period rating. And both of these parameters, n, and capital lambda are strongly dependent on the temperature of the strain and of the pressure. So what happens is when you put temperature, you are going to have a sheet on the wavelength, as you can see here. So first you need to define what are, in this case, this uh, constant for both temperature, strain, and pressure. And then an advantage that you have with this kind of sensor is that you can do Multiplexing means that you can put, for instance, five or six, I will say, uh, FBGs into a single cell. But the main issue that you can look at it here, if you look at the answer to temperature, strength, and pressure, you can see that uh, these sensors are not, when you use a single mole fiber, very sensitive to pressure. So in this case, you need to find a way that, uh, to overcome this problem. And this is more or less what we have been doing in collaboration with a team from Hong Kong, where they develop what we call a microstructure optical fiber, which is the same as a single mode, and which in this case, you have an empty space, means a large amount of air filling ratio. And of course, the sensitivity is going to be dependent on this air filling ratio. And you can see that we can now increase considerably this ratio, since we can multiply the sensitivity by uh, 8 by 8, as indicated here. So using this kind of track, we can have access both temperature and pressure, and you are going to see this is very important, and we can decouple this temperature and pressure using the equation. So now the question that you may ask is, are optical fiber or FBGs new to the field of battery? The answer is no, because the physicists have done a great job been doing so. But unfortunately, they didn't really try to understand the underlying thermodynamics and chemistry associated to these different effects. And this is more or less what we are going to do now. We are going to do now, but the first question to answer is really to know how these uh, batteries' performances is going to be affected to this type of optical fiber. And today, I will focus on the technology that we are developing, which is a Tiama technology based on the sodium-3 V2PO4 three times to the FA3C, which is a sodium battery. And you can see here the 1860s, where the fiber are there placed into the, uh, main, into the main core of the cell, and they are sealed with epoxy. So first thing is how sensitive are the battery performances. And you can see here you have three cells, one without any sensor, two with sensor, and you can see the data superimposed, which simply indicate that 
if fiber reduction does not affect at all the cell performance. So next, we want to use now this sensor in order to monitor the temperature of the battery. As a matter of fact, you want to do some kind of temperature imaging. And what you are looking here is two FBG, which are placed one in the center, one in the surface. And you can see that as a function of the C rate, you can measure the gradient temperature between the surface and the core of your cell. We can also do the same thing within the cell now by moving daily along the y axis, where we can, as I mentioned to you, since we can do multiplexing, we can have several uh, sensors and we can daily measure the gradient temperature. Here, you simply have a experiment where we put one at the top and one at the bottom. And you can see here that we have an idea of the difference of the gradient temperature between the positive and the negative that you have daily within the cell. Then we can go daily now more deeper into this investigation and try to monitor the wavelengths as, sorry, the wavelengths as function of the charge and discharge. And what you are looking at it here, you are looking two different cells which have different uh, uh, FBG. And you can see that the data nicely superimposed where you put, you uh, show the wavelength sheet. Then after, you can nearly look at the early the second chart, and you observe here that the main peak, the one that you observe when you daily uh, start to charge the cell, totally disappear. Which means that here, we are able to identify, to pin down what we call the SCI, that I will come back to it later. So the question now is, the ID, what are the ID, the heat associated to this temperature anomaly, which is, of course, what we are looking for. So in order to do so, what we need to uh, realize, we need to transform this temperature that you measure using this sensor into heat. And we do this by uh, an equivalent uh, uh, D model, which having the equivalent circuitry indicated here, where you see the temperature of the cell inside at the surface and at room temperature, where you have, in this case, the capacitance that represents the heat capacity of the cell, and where the resistance are the heat coefficient transfer. To make the story short, what you are doing here is you are measuring the heat gel generated by the cell, which is a big Q dot, that is the sum of the heat flow rate, small Q dot, plus this term, which is very important, is the cell cumulate heat capacity. So this is more or less what daily you can do, and you can convert your data temperature into it. But of course, when you have a new method like that, people are very critical as they want to know how valid is this type of conversion. So in order to do this, we were glad to have our friends Jeff Dan and Eric Logan, which really took a coin cell and really run isothermal calorimetry for us, and we compare the data. And as you can see here, the data looks quite alike, where you have here two big two peaks that we say, one associated to the NDTF structural transition, and those are one at the end of the uh, charging process associate some heat event. So you can see here that a small difference, a small difference comes simply from the fact that we are dealing with a coin cell in 1860, and it is associated, as you can see here, to the rate capability, to the configuration of the cell. But you may ask, you know, what is really the advantage of optical calorimetry with respect to isothermal calorimetry? And in order to convince you here that we brought added value, because by isothermal calorimetry, you cannot have access to the heat capacity of the cell. And uh, this is clearly indicated when you are looking at relatively low rate, and if the heat flow is nearly equal to, uh, I will say, the overall heat. Therefore, when you go now to high rate, you can see the huge difference. And this is kind of heat that, it's, that is presently uh, not taken into account when you do isothermal calorimetry because you don't have access to this value. And of course, doing this type of heat as a function of rate have a drastic practical consequences because this is very useful in order to design, I will say, other type of uh, cooling system. 
But the question we may ask now is really what other uh, uh, metrics or other thermodynamic parameters you can have access. Here also, we can have access to the energy potential as clearly indicated here. We can have access also to the entropy heat as indicated. And this is, and these parameters are very important in order to know the aging or the state of health of your share. Because you can measure or track, I will say, these parameters as function of cycling. I think this is what uh, Yazani has demonstrated in the case of graphite. And this gives you indication of the aging of the cell and the state of health. So this is more or less what you can get out from this optical calorimetry. And again, very simple device, simple three FBG. Now, question is, how can we get more information into the chemistry and what you are certainly most interested about? I go back to my uh, previous data where I use a single mode fiber. And you can see, I correlate now delta T as function of voltage as they do. And then, I am going to use now the multiple optical fiber, and I am going to sense pressure. And what you can see, that we have, at the same position of an increase in temperature, we have an increase in pressure, which corresponds to the formation of the ICI. And of course, on my second chart, this has disappeared. So this is quite important, because we can now, having the heat, determine the heat of formation in joule per gram, as well as the pressure of formation. And this, I will say, matrix can be used, as you are going to see, towards electrolyte selection. And I'm going to use a simple slide to convince you of this. First, I am looking at the same electrolyte, which is NP30, as you have the formula on top, and IPSX with EC and DMC, and the ratio indicated here. And what you look here at the Q dot, the heat generated is increased or is multiplied by a factor of two as you go from 25 to 50, 55 degrees C. And at the same time, note that the pressure also is nearly multiplied by two. So this is not a surprise, and it's telling you the idea that high temperature, you have definitely more gases and more heat generated as clearly indicated here, and this information are very useful when you want to set up or design formation protocol. So this is the effect of temperature. Ne next, let's look at the effect of electrolyte. So we have designed, working on the sodium ion system, uh, what we call a new electrolyte, a magic D, which is what we are using today, which is nothing else than NP30, and which we add several additives, such as vinyl carbonate, PMSFPI, and NIODFD. And you can see here, very surprising, look at the sum of the decomposition reaction for the formation of the electrolyte of the SEI, which is now, I will say, relatively small compared to NP30 at 55 degrees C. And even more impressive is the gassing. You can see that with this type of electrolyte, the gassing is definitively decreased to a, to a very low extent. And now if you look, at these two electrolytes in terms of battery performance at 55 degrees C, what you find, as clearly indicated there, is the idea that what we call the magic B, what we are using, perform quite better at 55 than simply NP30 at 55. So this clearly indicates that we could and we can, what we are now doing is using this optical sensing as a high throughput approach from benchmarking electrolyte and also for designing, I will say, a formation protocol. So now you may want to go one step further and you want to try to understand what are the type of chemical reaction involved into the SCI formation. And you can see I have two peaks in the case of uh, NP30 and I have a single peak in the case of Magic B. Now what I am going to do what you are used to do in a battery community is to take the derivative. And if I take the derivative, you can see that NP30, my two peaks remain two peaks. Now, what is very interesting, remember the single formation peak that I have for Magic B. Now, when I take the derivative, 
it came out about three or four peaks, of course, with a sum of energy being lower than T30. But this is quite interesting because now we can get even into the mechanism and to know what are the type of cascade reactions that are going on. And, and you can see here that in the case of NP30, where you have DMC and so on, everyone knows what are the decomposition mechanism going to the formation of alkyl carbonate and so on. Now, when the ID you are with magic B, in this case, you have the ID NR with the FB, which in this case, you have a stepwise emission of F minus ion leading to lithium fluor base SCI together with the formation of radicals that, re that react with carbonate. Means that in this case, you have a, a, a cascade reaction, reason why you see this so different. And of course, we can even, one step further, we'll not talk about it here, but by looking at the aging of these electrolytes and so on, which can identify which peak corresponds to each reaction. So this is more or less, I try there to show you that we can really get a large amount of information and we can use these derivative curves as a fingerprint to try SEI chemical formation states, hence enabling electrolyte selection. So of course, the question you may ask is, we have done this kind of stuff with the sodium-based battery, and what is very relevant, can we do this with lithium-ion batteries? And indeed, here you have what we have been doing with some kind of classical NMC carbon LP30 uh, lithium-ion batteries. We can see on the formation step, as a matter of fact, such cells were made nearly in the RS2E prototyping unit in Amiens. And you can see here that we can determine both the pressure involved during the formation as well as energy. And this kind of experiment, of course, are not specific to 1860, but they can be done as well, as you can see here, on either pump cell or 1860. Here, be careful, you don't look at the first cycle, you are looking nearly at the second and all, in the second cycle and so on. And in this case, cycle. So, all together, I hope that I convince you that this optical sensing is very useful for benchmarking, identifying suitable electrolyte formula, and defining optimized battery formation protocol. And of course, we can monitor thermodynamic parameters for cell aging or even spotting failure. But uh, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, if you do kind of a cell monitoring and so on, and if you define a cell failure, a misfunctioning, like a tumor and so on, like in the field of medicine, you are going to try to auto-repair. So then why, in the final part of this talk, I will have just to give you a flavor of what we are doing in terms of cell feeding and in terms of auto-repairing cells. And here again, we are going to get a huge amount of inspiration from human life. Human life, why? Because simply, you need to realize that the cell membrane of your body are nearly short air. What you have, you have a vitamin layer in which you have a protein channels, which are nearly the open gates to nearly different kind of uh, ions, and they regulate the ions going from one side to the next of the membrane. And all of these act by supramolecular interaction via some hydrogen bonding and so on. So we need to discuss to design a membrane to look at this issue. So we are being put in for biological membrane at first. But what I'm going to show you now is more or less, we have been really looking at the relevant supramolecular materials, which are not totally new in the field of batteries, since cyclodestrine has been used uh, and by few people. But this is more or less this kind of uh, uh, molecule with this kind of uh, channel cavity in which you have polar groups that are able to capture molecular species. And the advantage of such type of molecules is you have a several types of form, which we call alpha, beta, and gamma, which finally differ by the way or by the amount of a molecule or size they can track. So what we have been doing, we nearly, in this case, use polysulfide as a proof of concept and work in aqueous media, use sodium sulfide, and we try to nearly track this uh, polysulfide with cyclodestrin. So in order to study this host gas interaction, which means in this case, host cyclodestrin gas polysulfide, we have performed NMR, 
and we look here what is happening. When we look at NMR and we look the proton inside cyclodestrin, that I will call in the bottom H3, H5, and H6, you can see that the one that is more shifted is a proton H3, which is a simple indication that in this case, the, the polysulfides are really uh, trapped within the cavity. So having this information, we can really look now what is the association constant as in the case here by NMR, by looking at the uh, chemical shift by NMR as function of concentration. And what we found that the association constant is greater about two or three times for the beta type cyclodestrin instead of the alpha or gamma. So we have been using in this case, the beta cyclodestrin in order to look what now is the sensitivity to a different type of uh, polysulfide. And we found that the beta cyclodestrin has a very strong associating position with the polysulfide codon 2 S5. And I will come back on this point. So this is quite interesting, but now you know how useful is it to do a cell filling membrane. What is interesting now, if you look at this type of interaction as a function of temperature, you find that you can trap cyclodestrin at temperature of 30, 40 degrees C, but therefore, by increasing temperature over a range of about 50 to 80 degrees C, now you can release cyclodestrin, which means we can have a thermally control capturing and releasing of the polysulfide. And this, you can design the membrane, graft membrane with a cyclodestrin, which will be able daily to uh, selectively uh, up capture and release cyclodestrin. But now the question is, what type of membrane can we use, or can such membrane be useful to discriminate between the different polysulfides? And this is more or less the main question that we are going to address now. And once again, we are going to be uh, inspired by the field of medicine, of biology, where people have used a lot the coupling between a nanopore membrane and a biological membrane in order to, in this case, to do some sequencing of ADN or RNA and so on. So here, we are going to use the same kind of technique, the nanopore technique, which is relatively simple, as you can, as I'm going to see here, which is a simple technique <clears throat> that we can understand very simply in electrochemistry, where you have an ionic solution, you have two electrodes, and you have some molecules that are really uh, swimming around. You apply a bias voltage of a few, uh, few hundred millivolts, and what is happening? You are going really to drive some molecule through this pole. And on the right, you can see the answer. You measure the current as a function of time. And you are going to see some kind of <coughs> cascade current, where in this case, the dwell time <coughs> is going to tell you more or less information about the time that the molecule is going to spend in this pore. And the other very important parameter is the blocking amplitude, the amplitude of the current, which is going to give you an idea, of course, about the size of the species that are going there through uh, the membrane. So this is more or less what we have been doing. We have used this technique, but of course, we need to have a specific biology membrane. So here again, we move and we follow what has been done in the field of medicine, where now I am going to take a bipedic layer, you can see here at this zone with these two blue and yellowish, and which I am going to now to put a protein. Remember the membrane that I showed you before, bipedic layer, with in this case a protein, the protein where the gate channel. So we are going to cork this uh, protein within the membrane, and this is going to be what as an adapter in order, more or less, to uh, check or to sense the polysulfide species. So the experiment is going to is done as follows. Now, we are going to put this uh, polysulfide in cyclodestrin within the solution. We are going to apply the voltage, and we are going to see, more or less, what is the selectivity. And of course, at the beginning, we just put cyclodestrin and uh, beta cyclodestrin with Na2S5 polysulfide that I mentioned to you was the most uh, sensitive or most association constant. And what we obtain, 
is indicated here. You can see the two signals, of course, the one in blue associated with the classical cyclodestrin, and then you can see the complex in the red with Na2S5. So, which means in this case, we can separate the pure cyclodestrin from the one containing Na2S5. So, as you can, of course, we need to do now the same experiment with all types of polysulfides. <coughs> And this is more or less what I show you here, only the result, because the analysis is relatively complicated. And what I am putting here, the blockade ratio, remember, with the signature of the species that are going to go through the channel, okay, as function of time and time. And you can see now that we can distinguish different types of polysulfide, S3 to minus, S4 to minus, S5 to minus. And as a matter of fact, what you found, which finally is not a big surprise, is that the current blockade increase as the polysulfide become larger. But this is, a very, this is more or less, I, to my knowledge, the first time that we are able to discriminate between the different sulfides, polysulfide, sorry, and aqueous media. Okay? So this is more or less what we have been doing. So of course, you know, how, you, what, how useful this stuff is and how important it is. I should confess that it is not important till we don't move the ALE to organic electrolyte. <clears throat> because this is more or less what we we'll have to do as picture error and using organic electrolyte. But unfortunately, here we have a major bottleneck because we need to keep underground, fit underground, and we need to realize that the biologic membrane don't like organic media. So here we are moving into a completely different concept, and we are going to design our solid state nanopore membrane. Where in this case you take, for instance, a silicon nitride, and you are going nearly using microscope dig a hole of few nanometer. So this is more or less a type of study that we are going. So I think my time is nearly over. So let me conclude. So I hope that you are I shall show you more or less another aspect of my research nowadays, which is moving a little from the classical, where we try to look into the future of smartness of battery by introducing some sensing to decode thermal and chemical events, which will be useful the thermal parameter for fracking television, as I want to show you, and of course, all the work on this kind of uh, coupling between pressure and temperature sensor for establishing bat battery formation protocol, which is a trade secret of battery manufacturers. In terms of development of cell feeding, which is more or less quite futurist, I show you more or less the interaction between cyclodestrin membrane to trap and release as function of temperature the polysulfide and demonstrate that we can do in the field of batteries some kind of, I will say, discrimination or sequencing the various species. What next? Next, I think you all, were, all of you realize what is next in the first field. Now we go to the next step. And we have not only to identify the different steps of this, of this cascade reaction, but now we have to identify the molecule. And we are really working very strongly on this point together with determining the electrode trends during interpolation. Regarding the second part, we want to move to non aqueous electrolyte and explore, uh, explore other redox shuttles. And you can dream can we really explore the fact that there is a Alkyl carbonates are moving to the negative to positive. Can we really trap them into the membrane and so on? This is more or less what our futuristic view is. And all of this, I think, will be facilitated by the, uh, our new huge battery 37, 30, uh, 30 uh, program, where and there we are going to have at least the opportunity to uh, be able to conduct preliminary research, which means there merge people of the biology, medical field physics, and so on. So this is more or less what we are doing this day. So with this, I would like to thank all my team, especially the two people, Jiakan uh, Wang, which has uh, been developing with uh, Laura Albero Blanker, all the work on sensing, and Fanny uh, Betternier, ah, which has nearly done all the work on, um, on the membrane. And of course, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marie, for the amazing talk. Very inspiring.
we have one question from the panelists and then we can move through the Q&A uh, as much as the time permits us. Yeah. David. Oh, okay. uh, maybe I need to get uh, Thomas. David can ask, but he, he will ask in audio. Professor yes, David. Ask other question because I don't want to use this tool. Jean-Marie? Yeah. Merci. C'était fantastique. I would switch to English now. So, uh, I'm very interested into the, the, the first and second part. About the second part, the, the use of cyclodextrin, uh, can you, could you compare with like Nafion PFSC uh, membrane and, and I was not sure to understand when you release the sulfide, the polysulfide, yeah. uh, how can you direct the polysulfide only to the cathode and, and not? Ah, <laughs> yeah, very good question. Uh, because if you look at the shape of the cyclodestrin, it's a kind of funnel, right? Yeah. So automatically, when you're grafting the cyclodestrin on the membrane, you need to orient them so that they are your release on one side. Okay, and can you compare with PFSA? I mean, some membrane that should be also very selective. Uh, yes, but I think, you know, you cannot, uh, the, early, uh, the problem is uh, with, uh, with the Teflon, you mean, or Nafion? Yeah, yes, so, so, yeah, something that could be not too bad for lithium conduction, but, you know, yeah. it'd be more I, I, uh, Yeah, I think uh, we have not uh, been able to compare this to a practical system, <coughs> sorry, because we are working in an accused media. And this is more or less why we could not really uh, make a, a battery out of this uh, uh, membrane yet. Then why we want to move the area to organic uh, uh, electrolytes and use this kind of solid state membrane to uh, further demonstrate the concept. And then after being able to compare to what uh, you are talking about. Thank you. Okay, um, we have time for one more question. I'll read one from the Q&A. So it's a question from William uh, Apia. So uh, thank you for your presentation. It is possible to monitor, is it possible um, to monitor the dynamics of the SEI and CEI separately as a function of the changes in pressure and temperature as cycling proceeds? Could it be that other degradation mechanisms such as formation uh, of cracks in the NCM could also contribute to, contribute to the changes in the uh, in dependence variables? So this is the question, Jean-Marie, if you can answer. Uh, I think the, uh, the, first, the first part of the question is uh, about the mo monitoring of what? The dynamics of the SCI and CI separately. Uh, then this we, have, uh, we are in the process of doing it. We have not done it yet. Mm -hmm. But you can, yes, yeah, definitely you can do this. And then regarding the second question, is, uh, uh, in this case, what we are doing now, of course, <coughs> is they really try to uh, finally uh, study, analyze all these signals over long cycling in order to answer, uh, to answer your question about, you know, uh, long-term decomposition of the interface and so on. So this is more the type of work that is going on because this is uh, I mean, relatively new. It took us quite some time to put all these process together. Thank you. Now, one last question from panelists, from uh, Professor Sagar Mitra. Uh. Hello, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Taraskan. So uh, nice to hear you after a long time. Uh, myself, Sagar, you may know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so my question is uh, so the second part, uh, your polysulfide dianons, it is in dynamic equilibrium. So, how will you relate this uh, time scale with your electrochemical measuring time scale? Uh, what do you mean? Can, a dynamic, yes, a dynamic equilibrium. I think, uh, again, it's temperature. Yeah, but that time scale is. Uh... Oh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, wait, look at the last part of it when I am doing detection. The air, when you are doing detection, and it. Yes, the time, yes, yes. The time scale is very small. But air is just more or less a point, of, it's just for detection. Okay? So now, uh, of course, you know, and. Uh, the, the purpose of it is to show you that we can do sequencing. Okay, we can identify the mechanism, what's going on. Then after we are perfectly right, you are perfectly right, we are in dynamic process. So we cannot stabilize them. We just count really what is going on and which kind of cations or ions, excuse me, in this case can really go across the membrane. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Thanks for all the questions we can organize and send to Professor Jean-Marie. Thank you for joining us and presenting this fascinating work. We will move on.